All right, I see that our Zoom room is filling up. As usual, go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. We have a great program lined up for you. We are talking with Dr. Esther Obonio. She's the director of the Global Building Network, a partnership between UNECE and Penn State. Let us know who you are and where you're from and your Penn State grad year. Drop that information into the chat and we will be getting started in just a minute. I hope that if you're able to, you'll join us tonight at seven o'clock as the Penn State Alumni Association celebrates our 150th anniversary as an organization in service to Penn State. More information about that event, that virtual event tonight and the celebration of our 150th anniversary and the Renaissance Scholarship Fund can be found at our website at alumni.psu.edu. Again, tonight, seven o'clock, the 150th anniversary of the Penn State Alumni Association. Celebrate with us. Visit us online at alumni.psu.edu. I see the Zoom room continues to fill up. I see Lance Patterson, class of 85, zooming in from Skip Pack, Pennsylvania, near Valley Forge. Welcome, Lance. We'll be getting started here in just a moment. As with all of our events, this event is being recorded and live closed captions are available. Information to customize your closed caption experience can be found in the chat box in Zoom or can be found in the comments on Facebook Live. We will be getting started here in just a minute with Dr. Esther Abonio. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Thank you all for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session. Live closed captions are available for this event and it is being recorded. We are live streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access ideas and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This week's topic has been chosen to align with Penn State's Global Entrepreneur Week, an annual week-long celebration of entrepreneurship coordinated by the Penn State Small Business Development Center. Be sure to check out the full schedule of this week's events at gew.psu.edu. Again, that's gew.psu.edu for additional programming geared at current and aspiring entrepreneurs. This afternoon, we welcome Dr. Esther Obonio, the director of the Global Building Network, a partnership between UNECE and Penn State. Global initiatives have shown that at the bilateral and multilateral level, they can help unlock latent entrepreneurial potential through promoting synergies across groups of people of diverse backgrounds who have complementary sets of technical skills, problem solving approaches, and linkages to various stakeholders through both professional and social networks. During this session, we will showcase some of the learnings from the role played by higher education institutions from the United States and global partnerships directed at cultivating social impact driven entrepreneurial culture across the university system in the Philippines. In addition to Dr. Abonio's role as the Director of Global Building Network, she is also an Associate Professor of Engineering Design 
and architectural engineering. She served as the interim director of the Humanitarian Engineering and Social Entrepreneurship Program in 2016, and was also Penn State's inaugural, inaugural Global Faculty Fellow. Dr. Obonio was a 2015-16 Jefferson Science Fellow, placed with USAID Global Development Lab in DC. Between August 2004 and July 2015, she was a faculty member at the University of Florida. Dr. Obonio has extensive industry experience, having worked as a construction engineering project manager and innovations analyst in several engineering and construction companies in Kenya, the United Kingdom, and right here in the United States. Her work has been disseminated through over 100 journal papers, conference proceedings, and presentations. I'm now honored to welcome Dr. Obonio. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, students, granted. Thank you for the introduction and also thank you to the people who are attending the webinar for making time to join us this afternoon. Thank you, Lisa and Elizabeth for working patiently with me in the weeks leading up to this event and also Carrie who's hosting the event today and Paul. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes just sharing some of my experiences with you and their experiences that I've had within the context of synergies with different people, both here in the US and other parts of the world. I will explain how my journey began. My entrepreneurship journey started at the University of Florida. I will highlight some of the, the milestones from that experience that informed how I engage globally with other institutions. And then I'll do a, a deep dive of the experience in the Philippines and reflect on a few key takeaways. So because it's a global engagement, some of it will also point to some activities which happen outside of the, have happened outside of the Philippines, but they've informed how I engage with the Filipino ecosystem. So my journey actually started with a brick. At the University of Florida, where I spent close to 10 years, my colleagues sometimes used to call me the brick lady. And that's because I had a thrust of research activities that focused on looking on affordable masonry systems and <clears throat> addressing some of the durability, moisture damage issues, both here in the US and also in countries like Tanzania, Kenya, and also Mexico. And we also had a test bed in Florida. So as we were doing this, we were very confident that from an engineering perspective, it is something that if it is something that can be done within the laboratory, then we see a pathway to a solution things which cannot be done in the laboratory become a little more complicated. And one of them that struck me after we had been doing this work for about six years con continuously, I realized that even if we answer all the technical questions, it's still not going to answer one real life constraint, which is affordability. Our solutions were focusing on the low income context, low income communities, whether it's in the US, in Florida, Nebraska, South Carolina, Mexico, Kenya, Tanzania, India. The common denominator was really lack of money. So I started asking questions in 2014 about solutions that can be linked to, to market-based uh, ventures, solutions that can result in increasing the purchasing power of the person who we are targeting with our material because there's a limit to how far we can push the cost of construction. Even if we get to $10,000 for the cheapest unit, small cheap unit, $10,000, that is still expensive for someone who's living in, in, in poverty or someone who's economically constrained. So we, I, we started looking at some things that can be packaged into ventures. The material itself can be packaged into venture and also just looking at the machine that is used to produce some of these affordable materials. Some, some of them are portable, but they are still expensive. And, and we, we have some prototypes of smaller equipment that were also like better from an ergonomic perspective, things which address constraints such as like, you know, if it requires too much physical effort, how do we make it easy for a woman or someone with disability to participate in the process. And one of my contacts ended up setting up a venture that focused 100% on 
um, the machine itself and the building materials also something we can talk about. So we saw that that is possible, but then this is something that has been done. My professor at the University of Nairobi had been working on such projects from the 1980s. They relied on donor money, they relied on funding from nonprofits. And when the funding ran out, their, their enterprise also stalled. And that's another story that I'm happy to discuss with you at a different time. But that made me realize, like, if we do exactly what they did, this is not going to scale up. So I started thinking about the entrepreneurship ecosystem. I was at the University of Florida. I got very fortunate to participate in the first cohort of the Faculty Entrepreneurship Fellowship Program at the University of Florida. And what you see is the, the team that joined at that same time, the person, who's, the person who I'll highlight with my mouse, that's Mike Morris. Professor Mike Morris was the champion of the initiative. He decided to reach out of the business school and look for faculty members who are interested in understanding how the ecosystem functions and the role that we can play to support this. My pitch was 100% about building materials. And I was pleasantly surprised when they, when they accepted me into the program. So again, I joined this because I wanted to understand how to engage with the entrepreneurship ecosystem as a university professor who's working in masonry and being accepted because of what I articulated, which was close to my heart, just encouraged me to want to keep doing this. And then fast forward, around the same time in 2014, because now I was plugged into this community of people who are working in entrepreneurship ecosystems, I received a uh, an invitation to participate in a visiting professorship program, and it was entitled Field Dev. So like very many other professors, I did not read the small print carefully. So I thought, oh, this is great. Uh, this is a chance to contribute and also learn Field Dev. And I interpreted it as Philadelphia. The constraints, the social context that was described sounded actually like something that could be happening in Philadelphia. So. It was only when they contacted me and told me that they needed, you know, congratulations, you've been accepted. We need to buy a ticket and fly you to Manila. That is when it hit me that the social context that was being described is not in the US, it's actually in the Philippines. And uh, I traveled to the Philippines and <clears throat> this picture that I'm sharing with you was one of the, actually the very first presentation that I made in the Philippines. I didn't know, I did not know in advance that this was going to happen. So when they, when they told me it's going to happen, I asked them, what do you want me to share with 800 people, most of whom are very young students? And they encouraged me to tell my story. What did they mean? I am a person who was born in Nairobi, Kenya. I did part of my education in Nairobi, Kenya. I went to England, my graduate school, part of it was funded by a startup company. And then now I live in the US. <clears throat> so the fact that there's entrepreneurship involved, but also me being able to move from one place to another with the support of a lot of people was a way for, for me to connect with the students. And the connection happened. We had several um, workshops. I held several workshop sessions where I wanted to understand the fears and apprehensions of the students. Because if we are going big, the place where you have the really big numbers of people who can act on something is at the student level. So we were trying to understand within the, the, the university system in the, in the Philippines, what would make an entrepreneurship related program attractive to students? What are they afraid of? What are things which the university or the university system can do to help them transition into this space? A decision was made before the professors were pulled into the initiative. I think in the first cohort, we were five of us from five different universities. And a decision had already been made in advance that they will start with the College of Engineering. If you're familiar with how engineering programs um, work, you know that the number of elective courses that students have to take is, it, the number is so big that it's virtually impossible to squeeze in entrepreneurship in the formal structure. Thankfully, I discovered again after the fact, I had no, I had little appreciation of who Dado Bonatao was. Dado Bonatao was the, the brain behind the Field of Initiative. He's a, a gentleman who grew up in the Philippines, went to work for Philippines Airlines, and in the process, 
got tapped by Boeing to come and work in the US. He went to graduate school at Stanford and had more than 35 years of a very successful career, both as a, an innovator and an entrepreneur. And more in, in, in the latter part of his career, he started focusing on venture capitalism. So as university professors, we can write very nice reports. And we did that, like showing possible pathways to making a, connections, a connection to the students um, in the engineering programs, while also not excluding students from the social sciences and other disciplines, because as we all know, entrepreneurship is cross-disciplinary. But we do not have the power to unlock some, some, some resources or some additional things that need to happen at the government level. With his network, Dado Bonatao, we were, I was very surprised. I didn't know this was possible. Him working alongside his network in the Philippines, they were able to get the government, the ministry, the ministry that is in charge of higher education to adopt a resolution that every single engineering student who's coming out of their university system will get exposure to entrepreneurship. The program was, uh, the, the course was uh, given the name Technopreneurship 101. So from my perspective as a professor, you know, this is very gratifying to see that because of the ecosystem approach that was adopted within one year, in less than a year of us making a recommendation that the current structure is not going to make it easy for universities to teach students entrepreneurship in any form. The, the network that existed had enough convening power that they got this resolved. So Technopreneurship 101 became a thing that they were teaching. During the first visit, we were part of a cohort that was doing the groundwork, the foundational work. And again, I'm very excited to be able to say I was there on day one when nothing was being taught. Within one year, we came back, a team of us were brought back. I went to the same university, TIP University in Manila to try to test out the idea of if we are going to infuse Technopreneurship 101, where should it go? That was also a very rewarding process. And I went back at that time. Um, so 2014, 2015, 2016. And uh, at the end of the first three years, that, that's a program that, that was part of a program that was sponsored by the USAID. At the end of the three years, there was also a transition into what now they are calling the ICIP innovation for social impact, they started embracing the fact that the people who can benefit the most from entrepreneurship in this con context are people who are coming from poor and low income communities. And they, the, the team that was involved, PhilDev, they got into partnership with the Australian Embassy and also the UNDP. <clears throat> During that time also, I participated in the Department of State Jefferson Science Fellowship so I was again very fortunate that even though I had left the University of Florida, I continued to have an engagement with the field dev team. I, I was placed in the Global Development Lab and in the Global Development Lab within USAID, <clears throat> they adopt a 100% market-based solutions approach. They work very closely with university professors and students and uh, the, the, the lessons that I was learning informed some of the activities that I was continuing to do in the, in the Philippines. And this slide is one of my favorite slides out of the entire experience. Just the notion that good ideas can come from everywhere. They can come from anywhere. It was something that we lived in the Global Development Lab and then coming back to the Philippines or even my classes in the US telling my students that you don't need to, uh, you, you, you can have a good idea even before you finish your undergraduate studies. Good ideas are not limited to professors or subject matter experts. Anyone can have a good idea. And uh, again, this is aligned with how many of us, if not all of us believe that going through the entrepreneurship experience, especially at the student level, one of the biggest, biggest benefits is the character, the personality. From an engineering perspective, we have a problem with soft skills. Generally speaking, most people who go through the engineering curriculum, they need to work on the soft skills. The industry people tell us this as feedback all the time that our students are technically very strong, 
but some work needs to be done to enhance their technical skills, their soft skills, sorry, not their technical skills. So it shouldn't matter whether or not they start a venture. We want them to start a venture, but we don't want to give them the pressure. We want to put them in a place where if it happens, we're happy for them, awesome. And even if the venture doesn't succeed, if they don't succeed in setting up a venture, we are still able to step back and tell them that, hey, look at who you've become because of embracing the entrepreneurial mindset and orientation. And I tell people this because it's true. When I was running, when I was, when I was the interim director of the, of the humanitarian engineering and social entrepreneurship program, some students took the whole cluster, five courses, some took two, some took one, but it didn't matter. At the end of the course, if they were interviewing for an internship position or they were interviewing for a, a, a full-time position after graduation, you cannot beat them. Their personality and their charisma, their attitude, even when they talk about things which do not work, they're exhibiting those characteristics of entrepreneurism, of noble failure. So they, they can travel to Manila, they can travel to Nairobi and compete for a job with a person who understands the context and still float to the top because of their character, their personality and their mindset. So that was something which we encouraged the universities in the Philippines to adopt in their thinking that don't put pressure. Because if you think of Dado Bonatau, again, the person whose success and experience and expertise is informing how things have evolved, he did not start off as an entrepreneur. Bill Gates did not start off as a successful entrepreneur. This is a journey. For some people, it happens when they're young. For other people, it takes a little bit of time and that's okay. So in this new phase that now I'm continuing to engage with them, there's a big focus on social impact. And uh, again, we had uh, the, the privilege of hosting a team from the Philippines here in State College two weeks ago. And we connected them with several parts of the Penn State system to get, to, to get them to understand how our journey has evolved, how we are partnering with people outside of the university because we know they can benefit from the pilots, the prototyping that's being done within the university that generates evidence that this could work. And also from a university perspective, understanding that this is our reason as an institution for investing heavily in entrepreneurship so that was a mutually rewarding experience, having them here, having them come to see that even though we started this journey a few years back, several years back actually, yeah, we are still learning new things every day and we can learn some things from them. So one of the people who came to Penn State at that time as part of that cohort was the lady who you see here, her name is Donna, Donna Tapangin. Um, <clears throat> and, so one year after she visited, which is last year, they were here in 2018. In 2019, she was, uh, I guess, because we had already made a connection, she and her team requested that I be placed with the university, St. Louis University in Baggio. And uh, that was a highly rewarding experience for very many different reasons. I will share with you a video clip so that you can hear their journey. So again, you know, reflect on what I said previously. The whole program started in 2014, and this is where an example of one university, this is where they've got to. The university professors do not take credit for everything, but we definitely contributed. Welcome to St. Louis University Tech Hub Convergent Facilities. We are located at the northern part of the Philippines and was selected as one of the first five existing tech hubs by the Commission on Higher Education, or CHED. First is the CIRIB Center designed to support Techno 101 course for engineering students granted by the Commission on Higher Education. Next is our fab lab for production and prototyping granted by the Department of Trade and Industry to support our community students, researchers, and of course, our business owners. Our latest grant from the Department of Science and Technology designed for the TBI to support our startups and potential businesses within the community. Our Tech Hub framework that indicates the progression of objectives from motivation to incubation and commercialization. In order to sustain our Tech Hub, we produce and sell to our internal and external customers using the state-of-the-art machines within the area. We are also capable of helping address the pandemic such as COVID-19 
by developing the following, like face shields, aerosol box, disinfectant booth, and ventilators. We provide capacity and skill building through our trainings and seminars to our students, faculty, incubators, and more. We also invite experts, professors, and speakers here and abroad, including Dr. Esther Abonio, who inspired us how to teach and learn technopreneurship. Our TBI created a process called ICA to guide and monitor incubation projects. Insight, knowledge, and action. We monitor our incubators with set objectives and KPIs. And we are proud to present to you our incubators supported by the Tech Hub. Our active incubators benefiting from our eco process. Welcome. So I'm going to stop there so we don't run out of time, but you get the sense that they are active, they are flourishing, they are moving, they're growing from strength to strength. And again, the US university system cannot take credit for everything. We are part of a big team and we played our role and we are glad to continue to engage with them. So coming back to the local, I'll just reflect for a couple of minutes with you. Something happened when I was very new to Penn State, when I had spent maybe just a couple of years. I had given a talk at the Material Research Institute. Then I received a call, an email actually. Somebody invited me to have a conversation with them. And the question was, there is a problem of leaking roofs and the conventional solutions are very expensive. So they wanted to have a conversation with me because they had heard that I was doing affordable building material research and development in developing countries. So the affordability issue to them was attractive and, and we were, we've been exploring some concepts. There is a roofing system that's being prototyped again, not taking credit for everything. It's a team, students have been part of this process. But while I was there, I realized that there was some entrepreneurship that was also going on. My friend who I'm showing here, his name is Richard. I call him my citizen participation specialist. When I told him about this project, I was very excited saying, you know, global and local have been connected and I'm engaging as an associate professor of architectural engineering and engineering design. And when I told him what we were doing, I was surprised. He told me the level at which you're coming into the community is too high. So naturally I reminded him, Richard, I have to be right there on the roof. It's a roof leakage problem. But he opened my eyes to the fact that the roof is leaking. We know this, the roof is leaking because of lack of maintenance. Yeah, if we do not figure out a way of empowering the occupants of the house and getting them to the point where they can repair their own roofs, then I would have to keep coming back with my team or the teams of people who are working there to create a solution for them every single time. That is not sustainable by all means. So he pointed it out, he told me, Esther, open your eyes, look at yourself. You are not born in this culture. You know how to make money in this culture. The low income neighborhoods, that is one of their biggest areas of need. They need to learn how to make money in a capitalistic culture. So for me, it was like a big aha moment, building materials plus entrepreneurship, just the way it started at the very beginning at the University of Florida. I have this material, I have a low income community. Our technical solutions are not answering the question. We need to combine it with market-based solutions. We've come full circle right here in Pennsylvania. There are many neighborhoods that have poor quality buildings, um, um, dilapidated structures that are being used for homes. That's also a place where we can start thinking about entrepreneurship. And some of the lessons can actually come from places such as the Philippines. The video clip that you showed, people who've already made these connections with the local communities to the point where they're even producing things, we can learn how to do this. They can continue to learn from us. We can also learn from them. So a few key takeaways, what this whole experience has taught me, and I'll reflect mostly on the Philippines, the journey in the Philippines, the vision has to be bigger than an individual. 
Dado Bonatau is considered the equivalent of Bill Gates for the Philippines. He has a lot of money. He has a lot of people that he's connected to. He didn't go in alone. He decided to reach out to the business community in California, the business community in the Philippines. He also reached out to people who had connections with government agencies in the Philippines. And then, and then he also reached out to the universities and people who knew how to talk to the university list of leaders. So humility is important. Embracing the fact that good ideas can come from anywhere. Also thinking about leadership transitions. The team that I started this journey with in 2014 within Fieldev, they've all left. The last two people left at the beginning or during the lockdown. I was pleasantly surprised to see how their departure did not mean things stopped. It was like the team that is in place now is able to pick up from where they left and continue. Of course, some of them have been there for a couple of years or a little longer. Some newer people are coming in, but I, I respect their business model because even when the people who do the groundwork are not there, in the middle of a pandemic, they are able to continue. And then this issue of the return on investment, the transition or the modification of the initial focus on technology and entrepreneurship to include social impact, it was 100% connected to the fact that there are very many stakeholders who are in the ecosystem who are not university-based. And, and we as universities have to continue thinking about how we are redefining our goals, our objectives and our activities to address some of the needs that are not aligned with our own focus as a university. And then also just realizing that one, I mean, we know this already, one size does not, does not work, one size fits all does not work. I've been placed with four university, in four universities so far. There's a fifth one that I was supposed to have been deployed to as actually this week and, and next week. And we are not doing that because of the hurricane. What I'm realizing each time I move to a different university, because of historical reasons, because of how they were formed, is it a Christian organization? Is it, a, is it a, an organization that's, I mean, is it a university that is in a place that is very urban, not very urban, you have to tweak what you're doing. Yeah, and, and that's just, it goes without saying, there's no copy and paste. There's nothing that's being done in the US that can be carried and duplicated exactly the way it is. A lot of the experiences that I've shared with them, I've had to tamper them with what I know about the global South from being in Kenya and, and they embrace it warmly. Global means everywhere, including the US. I see it in the Office of the Vice Provost for Global Programs, and this is a message that we have repeated over and over again. And I'm very happy when I see connections that happen, such as this one, when people from the Philippines come to State College and we present them to several initiatives that are happening within our university system, and they can relate to certain things. They can relate to the experience in Penn State, New Kensington, for example, they learn from us, but we can also learn a lot from them, as I alluded to earlier, because, for example, the, some of the people who visited here who are not shown in this picture, they are working with a community that's called the scavengers, who are um, pretty much scavenging uh, something that they can eat or something that they can sell from, from landfills and things where, and garbage disposal sites. Circular economy is something that we are continuing to look for ways. To, to, to unlock value from. I was very excited when I had one of the examples of their successes that they are able to take mango seeds that have been discarded and transform them into flour. And from the university research that has been done, this is very nutritious. So they can combine it with flour and make bread. And you're killing more than two birds with one stone. You are addressing a garbage disposal problem you're putting money in the hands of the people who desperately need to have some source of income. You're also addressing food security, malnutrition related needs. So I, I think that's for me, it's like the thing I get very excited about that making these global connections and, and facilitating the process of knowledge transfer from one place to another. And uh, I'm gonna stop at that. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to me. At this point, I welcome questions, comments, discussions, concerns. And if you don't get a chance to share what you have with me today, I'm also sharing my email address, eao4 at psu.edu. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you so much, Dr. Arbonio. If you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A tab. I, we have some time left over here for some questions. You know, the first thing that um, that comes to mind for me is, is the entrepreneurial journey in different countries a little different than we might picture it here in the United States? So yes, it is different because of sociocultural reasons. It is different because of um, access to resources. So when I shared the video, for example, you notice that the lady who was speaking, her name is Maria, Maria Corazon Ocampo. Maria was showing us the facility they have to produce masks and things like that. And they do produce a few other things. It's one. That's the only facility of its kind in that entire university. And they are leading the growth for other universities. They are an example for other universities to emulate. So for a student, for example, who's in that environment, they will not get access to this, the things that my students at Penn State will get access to, or the community members at Penn State will get access to. So we are increasingly, like I'm increasingly shifting the focus away from start a company, start a company, and making it more of like, just focus on the process, go through this journey, be resourceful. All those are attributes of entrepreneurs. We are focusing on the mindset, on the character, because outside of the developed countries, the access, access to resources that can be used to prototype and do so many things is very, very limited and almost non-existent. So we, are, we, we, we flag that up as one of the barriers. And then some other things also have to do with the history of the people. If I'm coming into a foreign country, well, in my case, I'm perceived differently because from my accent, they know I wasn't born in the US. So that's a positive for me. Yeah, they're used to things being imposed on them. People from Kenya as well are used to people from the West um, imposing things on them. So there is suspicion and we are increasingly encouraging people to do what entrepreneurship says. So we are focusing on the process, the culture, the attributes, listen. When you go in the first time around, listen, stop, prescribing solutions, stop talking about the future. Yeah, listen to the person, empathize. Though, so at that level, it is very similar. The character, the personality, the process, the attributes. But the, the logistical details, the tactical de details, we have to follow the lead. We, are, we have to follow their lead. We have to listen to what they tell us that this is our, our constraint, these are our challenges. These are things which we don't think we cannot do. We, can, we don't think we can do the following things. And we take those aside and say, okay, fine. What can you do and how can I help? So I, I, think, of, um, I think of challenges that we might face on or challenges that entrepreneurs in the United States might face. Are they similar to the challenges that entrepreneurs face on, on a global scale? What are some of the biggest challenges that they face? You mentioned, you've mentioned resources. Uh, what are some of the other uh, other things that entrepreneurs face? So the government is also not usually, um, the government can be a challenge. Let me not say not usually. Working with the government can be a challenge. And I shared that the field of example of how they're interfacing with the, with the, with the government because it's, it's humbling. You, you have to be humble enough to know that I may not be in a position to get what I need to get out of the government, but within the bigger ecosystem, somebody will know someone who knows someone. So being resourceful, but even when you're very resourceful, there are just certain things that can happen like one person, I guess it can happen even here. Somebody can put something on Twitter and it changes everything. So right. <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the process that we, the ease with which we can set up a new venture in the US is not easy to replicate in several other countries issues such as IP protection, copyright laws, you know, things which we take for granted. It's like there's a process. If I follow the process, if I get the help that I need from the lawyers or the people who know how to handle IP issues, I will not be fully insulated, but I'll be protected quite, I'll be protected, yeah. For the rest of the world, the global South especially, they struggle with this. So the tech hub becomes, the, the video that I shared, it becomes the go-to place for everything. Like they're being, yeah there's an expectation that they will answer all the questions on how do I do this? How do I do that? And they try their best. They're doing a really, really good job, but we do acknowledge that if the 
bigger ecosystem was set up the way things are set up in the US. This is a positive for the Western countries in terms of working through the government requirements, then the tech hub would not have to worry about doing the heavy lifting on things like that. Funding is also a problem. I've attended several presentations where people say there's a lot of money, <laughs> but you are not asking for it right. And I mean, I've had that said even here in the US that there's a lot of money that can be used in low income communities that's going away without being spent. And, and I've asked, you know, what is the problem? The process for accessing those resources is very complicated. Even for me as a professor, I look at the forms that have to be filled and I'm like, well, I kind of understand what this is and what is required, but it is very time consuming. And sometimes I don't understand. Sometimes I'm like, this yeah. is very complex. Yeah, how do we make this accessible? How do we make it easy for the person who wants to invest money in social impact ventures to get connected to the people who have the social, social venture ideas, but don't know how to ask for it? Within Penn State, I imagine we can get help from Launchbox and several other places. If I'm not inside the US, if I'm in a developing country, where do I go? There are not yeah. very many places to go to. Yeah, it, it's interesting how companies here in the States, like you could find funding for an app to have food delivered to your home. Companies find funding for ride share, like I'm thinking Uber and how Uber continues to find to find investors. And yet, um, and yet ideas that are looking to solve roofing problems in, in third world countries or or water issues, or delivery of, of food production, and those have trouble getting have trouble getting funding. So it, it, it's interesting um, what gets what ideas get funded and what ideas um, continue to look for funding. Is I, I thought it was interesting. It seemed like a, a lot of the funding for some of the global entrepreneur efforts um, come from state entities, uh, come from governments uh, around the country. Is is the con I mean around the world is the concept of uh, venture capital uh, maybe not as as progressive around the world as it is here in the United States? So I think the Philippines is doing a, a decent job. And, and if you look at the bigger picture, the amount of money that they've raised from venture capitalism, etc., and even people who are putting in their time to support the growth of the entrepreneurship ecosystem from the private sector, it's quite impressive. But yes, I think US, um, let me choose my words carefully. Uh, US, in the US, we have more givers, generally speaking, in terms of charitable donations, um, people who want to put money to support um, social ventures like at large scale, it happens more in the US than anywhere else in the world. And I don't think anybody can argue with this. Like US is one of the countries or maybe the only country where I'll put a video or notification out, save the elephant, here is my go fund page and people will fund me, <laughs> right? In Kenya, my own home country, it will take, I mean, I, I think in Kenya, their, their priorities are on different things. I don't know enough about this, the, the social cultural context in the Philippines. So I'll use my own country, Kenya. It is easier for me to get money for a funeral, like somebody has died. They will right. give me money. But if I tell them, you know, I'm looking for money for a borehole project, it's going to gain traction very, very slowly. So the social cultural issues come up because I usually even tease people in Kenya about that and say, you know, why would you be, why would you be investing more in money that is going to be buried? <laughs> let's, right. let's fund the roofing project. They're like, no, we think a big send off is the most important thing. <laughs> so, yeah. so we have a couple of questions coming in from our participants first from Maria. Could you please talk more about how virtual programs can build on projects that used to be more focused on mobility, uh, which has now been restricted to COVID-19 uh, due to COVID-19? Yes. So I had a deployment at the beginning or in the middle of October, and it was virtual. Clearly, I couldn't go to the Philippines. So I, I, I did everything virtually. So there were very many things that were positive about that. So first of all, now I know that it is possible to do a virtual deployment, right. <laughs> but at the same time, there's a 13 hour time difference. 
So I, I, I was teaching from like 9 p.m. at night and that is not easy. It's not impossible, but it is possible. We know that it can be done. We had the option of opting out. I could have said, I don't wanna do this. It's not going to be easy, but I did it. It wasn't as effective as being there in person, but we, we did share a lot of ideas virtually through Zoom, through exchanging documents asynchronously. We're still continuing with some of them. So yes, in terms of being able to do more, reaching more students, reaching more faculty members, there is a potential. On the negative side, depending on the country that you're dealing with, if it is an emerging economy or a developing country, the internet connection is not gonna be awesome. There were times when many people could not participate because they were having connectivity problems. What other things happen? Philippines um, has uh, traditionally been impacted by adverse weather events. They've had typhoons. My deployment that was supposed to happen this month did not happen because they were hit by a super storm, by a super typhoon, not a super storm, by a super typhoon. But even if I was deployed in person, we would have had to have canceled it anyway. So that's, we will say that's nothing to do with the online platform. So yes, I'm sharing this experience, this very recent experience to say it can be done. As a person who does a lot of moving, I move back and forth, I go out of the country maybe five, six times a year. It takes a lot of time to get to the Philippines. The total travel time is close to 26, 27 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I live here on a Thursday evening. I get there because of the 12 hour time difference. I get there on Sunday night. In terms of productivity, it is, there is value in, uh, in, in doing some things, not everything, but doing some things virtually. Because I hadn't visited that context, the university I was deployed for the, to this year was a new one for me. I still do not have a handle on, if you ask me to talk about that university, I will not be able to describe anything because I did not go. And how do you get people like, I'm like, you know, send me pictures when you see the pictures and you're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. What am I looking at? There are certain things that happen when you are immersed in the environment. So my, my recommendation for a model, if we knew that we were going to go into a lockdown mode or something could happen to prevent mobility, I would strongly recommend having a short visit to familiarize oneself with the culture and then everything else can be transferred to a hybrid mode, to a, to a virtual mode. So um, yeah, during COVID, we don't have that option. So during COVID, right. when I was talking to these professors, I kept reminding them, I haven't been to your, your campus. <laughs> I don't know the cultural context. I don't even know what your city looks like. So right. yeah, whatever I tell you to do, you have to adapt it to your context. So I don't completely understand this other question. So I'm just gonna ask it exactly as it's posed. Um, is there a global, uh, a global local clearinghouse for wicked problems and other issues that are hampering the attainment of sustainable development goals? I think there are several platforms. And I, uh, if the person sends me an email, I can share one example with them. I don't have it handy, but I can share examples. So I'll start off by saying, I think there are several examples that are trying to play that role of a matchmaker, bringing together the problems, people who have problems that could benefit from social ventures, for example, bringing them together with people who have good ideas. Is the market saturated? No. I think there is room for exactly what you're talking about. Um, some of it will have to focus on regional needs. Some of it will have to focus on thematic needs. So I'm saying this because for my, my profession, for example, if I was looking for an affordable roofing venture, somebody either with a problem or a solution, I will not get any hits. So the answer is yes and no. There are platforms that are doing matchmaking, but they're not covering everything. There is room for new platforms to pop up. So this presentation uh, is part of a kind of co-sponsored venture because it's Global Entrepreneur Week. Can you talk a little bit about Global Entrepreneur Week and uh, what the Small Business Development Institute uh, does? 
So I'm not sure if I'm the best person to talk about this. <laughs> so okay. I, will tell, I will tell you what I know. Again, I am a university professor at Penn State. So I, this is what it means to me. Yeah. I, I believe with all my heart that the model that Penn State has adopted to conduct its entrepreneurship affairs is a very good model. When I talk to the professors in the Philippines, I make lots of reference to Penn State. By the time I'm done, they all want to come and visit Penn State. They actually say, you know, can we do benchmarking at Penn State? So uh, that's my belief. I believe that when President Byron made a, a, a decision in 2014 to go all, all in with making entrepreneurship at Penn State a university-wide phenomenon, phenomenon it, it was a very good decision and it had very strong backing from his office and several parts of campus. And as a result of that, we now have a way of engaging with entrepreneurship that extends outside of the walls of the university. Global Entrepreneurship Week to me, this is what it means. We get to tell our story. We bring our friends, not just Penn State people, people from outside Penn State to come and tell their story tell us their journey, things that they've been part of, things that they've experienced. And we also invite other people who are not part of the Penn State system to come in and share their experiences as well. This again, this is what global entrepreneurship means to me, our students. When I was a student, I benefited from having global experience. Going back to the question about COVID, I've been thinking about this all the time. I have created several travel opportunities for students to go to visit other countries, especially Kenya and Tanzania, because I'm paying forward. But now I'm asking this question, because of COVID and because we know COVID-like things, pandemics will prevent travel in the future. How do we get to expose our students to several things that they can benefit from in the big picture of the world? Like this is what is happening in other parts of the world. I see Global Entrepreneurship Week as one way. It's not the only way, but this is one way for our students to appreciate this is who we are as, a, as an institution. This is, these are examples of our successes. These are examples of things that um, our partners and our affiliates and our friends are doing. But this is also the big picture of how this can transform the world yeah, through yeah. different modalities, through partnerships, through student activities, through faculty activities. Um, yeah, so I, I will stop at that. and. And I think I, I will defer to people who work for the Small Business Development Center to talk about the Small Business Development Center. Well, we have put those resources in the chat. There's a link for the Small Business Development Center, as well as information about the Global Entrepreneur Week uh, that is going on at Penn State. So there's information in the chat for those who are interested in that. You said this is an opportunity to tell our story. And Dr. Abonio, you are telling the Penn State story all around the world, uh, and it's having both an impact globally and here locally. Thank you for all that you're doing for Penn State. That's all the time that we have today, but we're so grateful that you were able to join us on today's virtual speaker session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Please email me your questions. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months. This program is in addition to the wide array of online networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can find a full listing on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thanks again. And we are... Penn State!